Hello, this is Dr. DeShavo with part two of chapter 14. Why? I can't hear you. i got to clean up my ears. <laughs> We're moving on to ears. I know I'm such a dark sign. So, moving on to the anatomical structures. A lot of these probably are very familiar for you as you're probably looking in a lot of ears. I joke with my anatomy class about how kids love to stuff stuff in their ears. And kids look at me like, what? Because they don't have kids. I should say my college students look at me like what because they don't have children of their own they, you know kids love to stuff stuff in there so i'm sure you've looked at the inside of these ears but let's review these anatomical structures just in case so the oracle is going to be this rim around the outside and that'll lead to the external auditory canal which used to be called meatus depending on how long you've taken a p that'll end in the you know the tympanic membrane that includes the external ear. The middle ear will be from tympanic membrane to what's called the oval window, which is where we send the signals through the three ossicles or bones of the ear, malleus, incus, stapes. You know malleus because it's the one that touches up against the tympanic membrane, and I remembered the order as mis, M-I-S. Malleus touches incus, Incus comes down and touches stapes. Stapes touches what's called the oval window. And that oval window then leads to the inner ear. Additionally, in the middle ear is the eustachian or auditory tube or pharyngeotympanic tube, which drains this middle ear. In children, you know this is more horizontal, so it doesn't drain as well. And that's why they get that fluid buildup back into this middle ear, poor honeys, and they get the ear infections. But I went through that kind of quickly because I'm sure that's probably review for most of you. Now with this inner ear, we'll go a little bit slower because this may be a little bit of review for you. We have this closed compartment that has fluid in it. In our paralymph and this paralymph will go around the semicircular canals and also around the cochlea the cochlea is the part of the bone that holds what's called the organ of corti i have that in the notes later the organ of corti c-o-r-t-i if you remember it or don't is going to be the organ of hearing and within it will be fluid and hairs that act as receptors to stimulate the vestibular cochlear nerve. Now they have this broken down into cochlear nerve, right here, and vestibular nerve. Because as the vestibular cochlear nerve comes out, it will divide. And there's a vestibular portion and a cochlear portion. Now, signals will come in It'll vibrate that fluid, and it will send signals through the organ of corti so we can sense hearing. When we move, especially rotational movements, these semicircular canals, we're going to go a little bit more into this in the future slides, will sense rotational movements. And then there's two more receptors we're going to talk about that will sense linear movements. But all of movements and hearing will happen in these two regions. This breaks it down into outer, middle, and inner ear. It's all the things that we just spoke about. They do get into the saccule and the utricle, which together are known as the macula. And there's little sensory epithelium. They're basically two little spots between those semicircular canals and the cochlea, I have a picture of this further in the notes, and they detect linear movement of the head. So it'll be either horizontal, such as when you're, and I'll get into this, I have it in the notes, I promise, horizontal like when you're riding in a car, or vertical like when you're riding in a, uh, an elevator. The semicircular canals sense rotational movement, and the rest of those things we have spoken about already. So ears are going to process sound, detect body position, and help to maintain balance. That's why we're sensing rotational and linear movements. It's our body's need or sensation 
to keep the head over the sacrum. So if it senses that the body is rotating too hard or falling over, we can account for that and reset our posture. And then it breaks down the different anatomical structures yet again for you. So sound will enter through the ear, we know that. And then it'll travel through that canal, reaches the tympanic membrane, hits that, creates vibrations. Those vibrations then vibrate the three small ossicles, malleus, then incus, then stapes. You know the malleus is near that tympanic membrane. So the last one that vibrates will be the incus, which will then hit what's called the oval window. It's just a small opening that'll go to the inner ear. It's just like a little membrane. That causes that fluid within the cochlear, or actually specifically the organ of corti, to vibrate. It will send waves through the fluid that is in the organ of corti, which stimulates hearing receptors. Different locations along the organ of corti, along that sort of spiral like a snail shell, will stimulate different receptors, which tell us different pitches. Here's a picture. So vibration comes in, hits the tympanic membrane, hits those three bones, sends vibrations through the oval window, which will stimulate that fluid. That fluid then moves within that organ of corti. It will stimulate hair cells at different areas of that pathway. So high frequency will be stimulated. You could see just a little ways in as opposed to low frequency will stimulate deeper into that snail shell of the organ of corti. Okay. Don't worry about like numbers and frequencies. I want you to know and understand those concepts. As far as these membranes, okay, you don't need to do anything other than those generalities of what I've spoken to you about. So if I didn't, I won't touch you on it. Position and balance. So we have the vestibular apparatus located in the inner ear. Two parts. There are semicircular canals, which we looked at these three ring-like structures, and that has fluid in it as well that senses rotational head movements and body position. The vestibule houses the macula. This is actually a bony chamber, and so is the cochlea. The semicircular canals in the vestibule. These are all openings in the nice hard bone of the temporal aspect of the skull. So just so you know, it's like they're little caved out areas within the temporal bone. Within the vestibule, which is that bony chamber, you have the macula. So the macula, and it's right between the cochlea and the semicircular canals. I'll show you a picture in the next slide. This houses receptors known as the saccule and the utricle, which I mentioned earlier, and I've got on the next picture. The macula is a general term for the saccule and the utricle. So if we look at a picture of that, here are those three semicircular canals. One, two, three, okay? And one senses front to back. You don't need to know which one. One senses tilting side to side. This one will sense rotational movements. In the opening of all three of them, you have these cupulas, which just have hair cells, which sense that rotational movement. Once again, I won't get too crazy about those specifics. You should know that it goes out to the vestibular cochlear nerve, though. So those three will sense rotational move, movements. The utricle and the saccule house, so together those are known as a mac, um, the macula, which I mentioned earlier. Those sense linear movements. And I actually uploaded a picture for you because they're a little tricky. Okay. So utricle is sensitive to horizontal acceleration. So the hairs you can see are actually upright positionally in it. So when you move 
horizontally as if you're in a car, fluid will go across those and stimulate them. The saccule senses vertical acceleration, such as moving upward in an elevator, or downward in an elevator. You can see those hair hairs are sent <coughs> in the other direction, and those are stimulated when you move in that vertical acceleration or positional way. The eustachian tube, also known as auditory or pharyngeal tympanic tube, acts as a pressure valve between the ear, and that middle ear is a closed environment. So this eustachian tube actually allows a little pressure valve kind of response between the middle ear and the nasopharynx. So this tube is normally closed, but if we have to regulate the pressure in the middle ear, we'll yawn or swallow. And that'll open up the eustachian tube and allow the middle ear to pressurize basically with the external environment because the nasopharynx is open to the external environment. So the nasopharynx, if you don't remember, it's the part of the nasal, or the pharynx, I should say, behind the nasal cavity. And this is why when you're flying, if you yawn, you'll actually open up that eustachian tube and you'll allow that pressurization to equal between the middle ear and your external environment. Kind of a cool little thing. So, question type. The semicircular canals are essential for hearing. True or false? Answer that, and let's move on. We just have a short little bit here for taste and smell, because they are very basic and very simple. So, Taste includes the taste buds on the tongue, and we know that. I'm not going to get into the specifics. By the way, tongue mapping is not true. You have all sorts of taste buds that sense salt, sweet, bitter on every, um, every papillae on the tongue, just so you know. as a sidebar. I won't touch you on that because it's not in the nose, but just so you know. But if we have cranial nerve damage, we can actually have loss of taste. This is one way we can screen and test patients. So it is important for you to know and understand which cranial nerves innervate which parts of the tongue. The anterior two-thirds of the tongue is actually innervated by a facial nerve. It will sense taste to that anterior two-thirds of the tongue. Glossopharyngeal sense taste to the posterior one-third of the tongue. The vagus, this is so cool, will actually innervate taste buds that are on the epiglottis and in the post, the pharynx, like just where the pharynx and the tongue meet. And the reason that's kind of interesting to me and the way I actually remember it is those taste buds will taste the aftertaste of fake sugar. Whenever I have fake sugar, I can taste it way back in my throat. It's because the vagus is stimulated, cranial nerve 10, and it's stimulated because it has innervation or nerves going to the epiglottis and the pharynx, which I always thought was kind of cool. So depending on which cranial nerves are affected, a patient can lose taste to any one of those three sections. Are they easy to test? Of course not. But, you know, if somebody has loss of taste, period, you should be concerned. Smell. Olfactory nerves, and I'm going to show you a picture and actually quiz you a little bit, will come up through the nasal cavity and through what's called the ethmoid bone. It'll then go to the old, so the olfactory nerves go up to the olfactory bulb, which is just an extended front part of the olfactory nerve. That olfactory nerve comes back and into the brain. So the only reason this could be clinically important is if somebody has a really bad acceleration, deceleration accident, such as in a car accident, where their head flings forward and back severely, you can actually rip these olfactory nerves right off the um, ethmoid bone. So they might have a loss of sense of smell. So let's practice. If we look at this, these are the taste pathways to the central nervous system via those cranial nerves. So I want you to pause the tape and tell me what cranial nerve innervates this one, what cranial nerve innervates this one, don't look at the answers, just really they're written very small. And what innervates that one? Pause the tape. 
if you need to. Otherwise, I'm going to reveal that. So anterior two-thirds of the tongue. I know my boards like loved asking this for some reason. I think it's because you have to remember the cranial nerve location and the percentages. <laughs> so facials anterior two-thirds of the tongue. Right, glossopharyngeal is posterior one third of the tongue, ton is pharynx and epiglottis. And once again, with the cranial nerves brain dump, go in one through 12, root them down, sensory motor both. But my birds love that. I know I got two or three board questions for that. So I was trying to look, I'm like, hmm, what would they ask you? Now, this is going to be which cranial nerve? Olfactory. Yep. I want you to tell me what this is, what this is, and what do you think these ner nerves are, okay? So, pause it if you need to, okay? This bottom one here, those are actually fibers of the olfactory nerves. They are exposed to the external environment, if you take a look. That's the open nasal cavity, and that's an interesting thing because some people theorize that meningitis can actually get to the brain through this pathway, interestingly enough. Above, right here, we have what is called the olfactory bulb. And I know that's kind of new to you, but that's a rounded anterior portion of the olfactory tract, or nerve, you could say. So I like this picture because it shows how it passes through that cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone. And the ethmoid bone is just one small part of the skull. All right, that finishes the basic anatomy and physiology of sensation. We will start disorders in the next video. I know this is a shorter video, but I'd rather do that and break it up so all the anatomy is in one video and the disorders and the dysfunctions are in the next video. So I will see you in the next video. As always and forever, if you have any questions, let me know. Thank you and see you soon.